I'll just start the class, okay? So this week, we're going to be going over all about the infants. We're going to be talking about the toddlers, and we're going to talk about preschool. And this is uh, your younger ages, and there's a lot of developmental milestones that you need to keep in mind as we do it. You know, as I said, and I promised you, I want you to do your quizzes after class, not before, and you all listen, so thank you. Um, there's a lot of confusing things. I mean, these first, if you look at it, these are five years from one, zero to five. There's a lot of stuff that these kids go through. And then these theorists, oh my goodness, how can I understand all of those? So we're gonna start talking about those. You do have quiz one and there is discussion question two that is up. The one thing I can tell you is to remember to cite within the body of your paragraph. You, most of you have put your references in, but please make sure there's a citation. For instance, it's parentheses, Perry et al, 2022, parentheses, somewhere at the end of a, a sentence. This just shows me the book has given you information if that's the uh, reference you use, okay? So I will send you messages regarding that. You're also gonna see in the first discussion question as I get them done, I'm gonna talk to you about how to think. It's called AdPi, okay? But how to think. And it's again, um, I want you as you're trying to answer questions, I would take this little thing that I've given you in the comments um, as you will get them. You all haven't gotten them yet. I haven't finished. I mean, I just, this is, I've just gotten okay to, you know, this is now Monday. You just finished last night. Um, add pie, write it down, copy it, put it somewhere. And as you're answering questions, think about that. And it will help you as you go forward, not only in my class, but med surge, which is most of your bear. That is that one that's like, oh, if I ever can pass med surge too, but it's gonna help, okay? So it is a great tool for you to use. So discussion questions should be done and graded by Wednesday. I teach today, tonight, and tomorrow night. Um, I will get some of them done tomorrow and some of them will be done on Wednesday. And I try to get them done quickly please go and look at the comments I put. If you don't have a perfect 20, there was something you could have improved, okay? So I will have put that in your comments so that if you're the one who likes to get all 20s and I'm one of those OCD people, I wanna get 20s and everything, I'm gonna look. I'm gonna say, oh, I didn't do this or I didn't do that. I'm not completely crazy about APA. This is your first really times you're using it, but as long as you're getting it, you're having references there. You're putting it in an understandable fashion. I give you credit, okay? And I don't expect you all to have PhDs in APA at this point. I remember when I started, I didn't. So you need time to practice it. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna be going over our PowerPoint. And then again, I have a Kahoot. Now this Kahoot is 55 questions this week. Most of the week's cahoots will be more. These cahoots, again, I've gone through the PowerPoint, I've gone through the cahoots, and I've looked at those areas of weaknesses. I've seen them in exams, and I've seen them in your HESI that you just took um, the last semester. I look at those areas of weakness and make sure I've put those concepts in questions in your cahoots. So again, it's been changed every semester it's changed, so it is there for you. It's a great tool, use it. I put a lot of time in there for you. So week two, we're gonna start off with infants. Infants, toddlers, preschoolers, chapters 31, 32, 33. So when you're an infant, can you imagine you're born at seven pounds and by your one year old, you should have tripled your birth weight, your 21 pounds. You've gone from a baby who can't lift their head, no head control, to almost a child who's up and walking and some of them are running. It's amazing the differences in that first year. I always say, do not blink because children grow that quickly. We know the central nervous system, 
Your growth is faster than any other time during your life. So nutrition, nutrition, nutrition is the most important um, thing that we need. It affects the growth and development, cognitive development on um, infants. So making sure the baby's eating well is good. How do we know they ate well? Well, every time you go to the physician's office, the pediatrician, what do they do? They measure the height and the weight. Doesn't that measure that they're growing right? If they have enough weight, which will show, do they have enough nutrition? Do they have too little or do they have too much nutrition? Are they getting too many calories? It's all can be said by a height and a weight. So of this slide, what you need to know is about nutrition. We grow quick. We double the birth weight by six months and we triple it by one year. And we know children all of a sudden get pudgy and then they get longer. Then they get pudgy and they get longer and taller. And you can see this in these children. All of a sudden they look really, really pudgy in the cheeks and all of a sudden they look thinner it's because they've grown with their height. As they get older, their vital signs change. You know, we're born with an infant, normal heart rate's 140 to 160. By the time they're one years old, your heart rate could be 100, 120. Your respiratory rate, which was 40 to 60 at birth, could now be 20 to 30, and this is normal. This is why you need to know vital signs on children. All adults are all the same. There's no thinking, but children are all different. So it's something that you need to pay attention to. Another thing that changes is when an infant is born, they don't start making their own red blood cells immediately. They um, get everything from mom. They get all of their immune systems from mom. And as they get older, these defenses, these blood cells die off. So now we have to do something to protect these children from infections. And we need to make sure that they're getting enough iron in their blood because the cells are coming off. So we know an infant be born with a normal hemoglobin hematocrit, exactly what mom's is, right? By the time they're three to six months, they're in what we call that physiologic anemia. Why? Their cells are dying. They're not replaced yet. Then all of a sudden they start making their own cells. But think about what hemoglobin hematocrit does. Hemoglobin carries around red blood cells. Red blood cells carry around iron. Iron is what gives that uh, infant strength and energy. And also we know that they start getting more um, defenses. Their immune system gets bigger too. So if you have a kid who's sick earlier on, we know it's probably because they don't have enough immune system yet with it. Their head when they're born is huge. And by 12 to 18 months, we know that all of the fontanelles should be closed. And we know that chest should be getting bigger than the head or at least equal to. So you have the posterior fontanelle in the back, usually closes that little soft spot, closes about six to eight weeks. And the one in the front closes by 12 to 18 months. But why do we need to know that? Well, what if it closes too early? That brain can't grow. Or if it doesn't close at all, that means the head's open. And then I'm saying, well, why is it open? Is it extra fluid in the brain? Is there a tumor in the brain? It needs investigation, okay? Also at birth, you know, we've seen those little mobiles those mobiles that we give infants, they're black and white because they don't see color yet. And that's true. Their um, visual um, responses are changing. They go from seeing out of one eye, but there is no coordination. If you put your finger up, put it on a point in the wall, you'll see both eyes. There'll be one that is more dominant over the other. Infants will still have two points of reference. That's why there's no depth perception. They can't see it yet. It's as they get older, they see it. Also, we know their hearing gets more and more defined as they get older. The central nervous system is growing and it's expanding. I mean, just look at just those grasps that we were talking about quickly in those uh, cahoots last week. We have a reflex palmer grasp, 
that becomes a palmer grass, but you just go and you grab it when you want. And then it goes to pincer grass and then it's building blocks of dew, putting your hands in and putting blocks in. This is that central nervous system getting better. It's the head lifting up, then they're rolling over. These are all things the nervous system does. It helps with the nerves, it hurts with the muscles and the child moves forward. And all of these steps, you know, are those developmental stages that we looked at. And we know if they're not getting nutrition, they're, they're not gonna understand as much. It's not gonna go from a reflex um, grasp to a voluntary grasp because they, they don't get it. They're cognitively, they're gonna be delayed. The one thing great though, I'll tell you about infant, you give them therapy and these children catch up quicker than quicker than quick. So their immune system, we know it comes from mom. We know that breast milk is great. We know that breast milk does give the baby all the um, immune system that they need from mom. Because when mom's fighting a cold and the baby's with mom, she's giving her antibodies to that infant to help protect her from getting that sick or whatever she's had. We know that that Burnix also is part of a protection and found a really good picture of what it can look like. And I call it cheese, like all over the body. And some infants are born with a lot of it and some kids are with nothing. But remember, as we get older, their body becomes more and more um, able to accept antibodies and to mature them and to work. So by six to eight ages, we know we give those immunizations because we give them at two months, four months, and six months, we've seen that in the immunization chart. And we give them that quick because mommy stuff is wearing off quick. So if we're giving them starting when their body's starting to be able to accept these antibodies and put them into their immune system, that's when they're gonna go. <clears throat> when a baby's born, <coughs> excuse me, when a baby's born, they cannot hold heat at all they tend to lose heat. That's why infants, when they're born, they're put right on a heated warmer in the hospital, right? And we know that they're wrapped up in blankets in their little bassinets with as many blankets as they need to keep their heat. As they get older, their body's gonna mature and they're not going to be needed to be wrapped up like this little baby on the bottom right. Now, when I see this picture, I'm gonna tell you, I always chuckle. In South Florida, where I worked in pediatrics for the last, I don't know, 30 years, whatever it is, long time. I worked in the emergency room the last 10 years and we'd have infants come in to the emergency room with a fever. And we'd have parents of cultures, Hispanic being one of them, that believed if you had a fever, you needed to wrap them up so they couldn't get cold. But what that did is it held the fever in and actually made it higher. And you think that this outfit you would never see in South Florida. I'm telling you, I've seen it before. I've seen it with hats and hoodies and gloves and shoes and three different t-shirts and coats. And it's 78 degrees outside. I mean, I think that's warm enough, you know, with just maybe two sets of clothes and maybe a blanket, maybe, maybe. Their kidney system, you know, we know it works. We know that they urinate, but it's not completely mature yet. So we know that um, looking at infants, how do we know if they're urinating or not? Well, adults, they say 30 mLs an hour. That's the minimum, right? That's what you're taught. Well, in infants, just like giving drugs or anything, it's always milligrams per kilogram. Well, this is mLs per hour. So if we're not putting out good wet diapers and they say four to six, six wet diapers a day, then they're not getting the uh, urinary output that they should. So that's how we would measure it. And then I'm gonna say, well, how do you measure urine output in an infant? They're too small for a Foley catheter. So they urinate in a diaper, right? If you take the difference between a uh, wet diaper and a dry diaper. So let's say number one diapers are 30 grams. You take a diaper off an infant and it weighed 60 grams. We know urinary output 
was 30 mLs because it's mL per gram. So the difference between dry diaper and wet diaper is urinary output, and it's very accurate. At birth, the GI system is very immature. That's why we do not give anything but iron fortified formulas or breast milk to start with. And if we do have to give it for things like reflux, they don't absorb it, they don't use it. You will see it come out in the stool. So it's if we're giving these like a rice cereal in formula or breast milk because of reflux, it's only to thicken the formula or the milk to hold it down. It's not for nutrition because it will come right out. Now, remember we talked about F fingers by motor. This is what we do with our hands. G is gross motor, get up and go, go, go. That's movement, okay? So F is fine. Now, when you're reading questions, make sure you look, is it fine motor? or gross motor. These are two things we look at with infants very closely. So make sure you're knowing what you're trying to answer. Now, fine motor, we know that they can grasp an object voluntarily about two to three months. Then they could take and put it to another hand about seven months. They have a crude grasp, not that the cute little finger to a Cheerio or a little puff ball, that's fine. Crude is like taking it and smooshing it in the mouth. And that's about seven months too. By 11 months, they take things out of container and they could build a block of two. This is normal type of book knowledge, they say. Doesn't mean that a child is gonna wait till a year to build a tower of two blocks. It could be earlier. It's a guideline. Again, there's a little test for you to go back and look at it. Gross motor, get up and go, 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 okay? <clears throat> so the first thing an infant does is they lift their head up. Some kids do it soon, but it's usually within two to three months. You'll see that head come up. Then you're gonna see them go from their bellies and all of a sudden they flip over and now they're on their back. This is when you have to worry about your children if you put them on the couch or if you have them on the changing table, they will roll off. And I've seen many a parent run into the ER. My baby fell off the changing table onto the floor. Oh my goodness. And you might see a little lump or a bump, maybe not, but we need to teach safety. By six months, it's back to front. So the first thing is their belly first to back and then it's back to front. Then they get up on their knees and they're gonna crawl actually backwards first. Then they go forwards. And then by about eight months, they should be able to sit without support, without pillows and stuff propping them up. They should be able to sit at eight months of age. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen at six months. Doesn't mean it's not gonna happen at 10 months. This is your guidelines. As long as a child's moving forward, and doing these sort of developmental stages, they're okay. Also, if they're on their back, by 10 months, they should be able to turn over, pick themselves up and put themselves on into a sitting position. Now, I talk about gross motor and it, you know, as long as you're moving forward. My grandson, as I told you, you're gonna hear this part of the lecture. This kid never walked. At 15 months, he ran. And that's not unusual, as long as he was doing everything else, which of course he was. So here we go, go. nutrition, nutrition, nutrition. We know the first six months, that's all they should have. We know that a breastfed mother will always be concerned if they've gotten enough. So as long as they have six to eight wet diapers a day, we know they're good. And we know breastfed usually has a lot of more of stool. They stool a lot more. It's just part of a breastfed. And we know that if a baby is gaining weight, we know there's getting nutrition too. Best breastfed babies should get vitamin D and it's all about muscle control and for your muscles, et cetera. It helps with those developments. So after, 
the first six months, we're going to start introducing food one at a time, four to seven days in between each feed that food that we introduce. We are really careful to make sure a child is not allergic to a food. Well, how do you know if they're allergic? Well, some kids are, you start the wheezing and that anaphylactic looking thing, but usually not. What you usually see is like rashing, rashing like in the bends of the arms underneath their neck and even diaper rashes might show that this kid is, you know, really doesn't tolerate that food. It's not an allergic response, but it's an intolerance and that food, we can change it for a different food. And then you're like, do you start fruits first, vegetable first? What do you start? Cereals? Well, you know, every different pediatrician does something different. As long as it's one at a time, four to seven days in between each one before we add the next one. Children should be busting teeth somewhere about eh, eight months old, six months old. And some kids never bust one at 15 months. Like my grandson, he got six. Both my children never had teeth earlier. All of a sudden they had six and it was 15 months all at the same time. So you could feel them, but they weren't there. They say you should be the age of the child in months minus six should be the number of teeth. So by eight months, they should have two teeth. And I'm telling you, not all of them are like that. Cleaning their teeth. Now you can use a warm washcloth, no toothpaste. You could use a soft toothbrush. Um, again, no toothpaste at all. We don't start using fluoride till six months old. And one of the things is, you know, and this is hard if you have twins or multiple births, no bottle propping, do not bring uh, milk to bed. <clears throat> milk is sugar in it and it will rot teeth. And of course, no fruit juices. Sleeping, infants sleep a lot. They should be sleeping all night long. Once they get the pattern, they should have multiple napping. Um, the one thing about breastfed infants, usually these children will wake up more frequently. They're gonna wake up every two to three hours to eat. Usually formula fed um, infants will sleep longer. They're saying that they don't need walkers, swings and play pens and all of us use them. We think that the rocking is a great feeling on the infant, but the book says you don't need it. <clears throat> These are the different sort of um, immunizations. We know hep B is number one. And then as they get older, we will um, introduce more. The one thing um, about immunizations is live vaccines, just like adults, you can't give them if there's some sort of immune disease. And you're saying infants, immune diseases? Well, some are born with sickle cell. Some are born with thyroid conditions. Some are born with cystic fibrosis. So always remember live vaccines you never give to an immunosuppressed child or an adult, or if they're on steroids, that renders you immunosuppressed. One of the special health problems is colic. I think colic is one of the most difficult thing for any parents to work with. This child is always full of gas, always crying. You know, sometimes you just put them in the car and start driving because the movement of the car helps them fall asleep. You, you're at your wit's end. It's hard. It's a really hard thing. And there's really no magic cure. It's a little bit of everything. So. These are parents that I would really say, it must be difficult on you. You're doing a great job. Here, what can I do to help you? Are you burping the child well, sitting the child up? Are you using those drops, those semethicone drops, et cetera, et cetera? Another thing that can happen is what we call failure to, failure to thrive. And we know that by their weight not gaining, right? Failure to thrive is, sometimes a metabolic problem, sometimes something in the digestive system. It could be the types of formulas. And some children don't gain the weight they should. 
So if they're born at seven pounds, at six months, they could only weigh nine pounds. And I've seen it before. So it is doing an investigation, finding out why. Why doesn't this child gain weight? And what can we do to help the child gain weight? Because we know weight gain means they're getting nutrition and then the body needs that nutrition. So finding out why, there's all different things we can do. I think one of the um, biggest concerns on a well newborn is we are now promoting back to sleep, which means putting them on their back to sleep. I have worked in pediatrics so long that I've seen all different changes in prevention of SIDS death. And SIDS death, we have seen that if we have a child sleep on their back, there's less incidence of um, SIDS death. But what happens? The backs of their heads get flat. And parents are concerned, but look, what about that? Well, this little helmet on this bottom right, this little red shirt that this little child has on, this can help have the head turn nice and rounded. The one thing that's so great about infants and their heads, they're soft. They are moldable, they're malleable. So I would suggest, and it's the best suggestion, have them on their abdomens during tummy time when they're wide awake as much as you can, because this will help that head, you know, round out. Again, my grandson was one of those flat heads in the back and my daughter was concerned. And that's exactly even what the pediatrician told her. I told her, but of course the doctor had to tell her too. And the kid's head is perfectly round today doing tummy time on the abdomen. So that's called positional plagiocephaly. We see this a lot in premature infants that, um, for instance, if they have this diagnosis where they can't move at all for the first month of life, they might have a flat head. And even uh, premature infants, I've seen what we call toaster head. One side and the other side are both flat. And the back isn't by just the turning of these um, infants. Children get dermatitis. Now, this is one thing you see with the introduction of foods. You might see them never have a diaper rash and all of a sudden they get it. That could be telling you that. Or I know um, my children and many uh, children I've worked with, they're allergic to a brand of diaper. My kids could not wear um, Huggies, but they could wear Pampers. My, that was my grandson. My children couldn't wear Pampers, but the grocery store's cheap brand was the best one, which I was happy for, but it is finding out what they're allergic to, uh, what they don't tolerate. How do we treat diaper? Opening them up, free to air, just you know, washing them with soap and water. And then if it's a yeast or something, putting that type of cream on there for them or that powder on there. So like Nystatin for those yeast type little bubbly looking thing. This one here looks more yeasty and we would open it up, let it dry out to air, but nice powder. The other thing that happens and, you know, we want our little babies to look really cute and we comb their hair and put little bows and ribbons and whatnot, but they have this cradle cap, the seborrhea dermatitis, and it's really scaly, you know, especially in the first month or two, how do we get rid of it? Well, you're gonna wash it every day like you normal do with soap and water. You might put some mineral oil or lotion, but a little fine tooth comb and very softly, gently comb it. And eventually it will go away. It's not gonna go away in a day. It's something that will take time. Since I've mentioned it, here are risk factors. You know, I was mentioning last week, the one thing I never knew was males are more apt for SIDS death than females. I never knew that. Well, now I do know that. We know them sleeping on their tummies. We know that cigarette smoke, um, having them too hot. Breastfeeding helps them not get SIDS death. Um, and it could be something to do with uh, sleeping in the same mattress with the parents. I've seen that happen. Or soft mattresses, too many toys. They smother their faces. All of these things are risk factors. And what if they just had an upper respiratory infection? 
you know, little, um, you know, nose full of, you know, mucus and they can't breathe because they breathe through their nose. They don't know they can breathe through their mouth. And if it's full of mucus, they don't know that they also can breathe through their mouth. It's, it's a crazy thing, but little infants don't know that. Here's something that we call all teeth, an apparent life-threatening event. And this is um, your small infant who um, all of a sudden chokes, gags, and turns blue, scares the parents. It could be reflux or it could be something neurological. And these all T events, as we call them, is something that we take very seriously. These children will all be admitted and they'll go through a workup looking, is it reflux going on? Or is it something neurological seizure something? And they do this workup. And when they send them home, they're going to send them home on this apnea monitor. This apnea monitor is just a little um, cloth that goes around with a little Velcro, has two little type of leads that will touch the skin and it will monitor their heart rate and respiratory rate. And the alarms will be set. And if it goes too low or too high, it's going to squelch this ear piercing sound. And this helps prevent the child from maybe going too much to sleep or having this alti event you know, that you don't see. And we all need to sleep. You don't need to just sit there and watch the baby sleep all night. So this does help. And it also, this sound will wake up the infant. So Letitia is breastfed infant being seen at the clinic for her six month checkup. Her mother tells the nurse that Letitia recently began to suck her thumb, which of the following is the best nursing intervention. What do you think? Why is she all of a sudden sucking her thumb? What do we know about infants and their mouth? They explore the world through their mouth, right? They take care of their stress through their mouth by sucking on something. So this is normal. This is what an infant's doing to self-soothe. They're soothing themselves. So it's actually not a bad thing at all. So here we are. Theorists, right? Erickson, Piaget, Freud, and Kohlberg. These are the ones that we're going to be discussing. So infants. Infants is trust versus mistrust. And what does it mean? That means your infant has this thing that they do. If they're in the room and they need you, they cry. Why do they know to do that? I don't know, but they know they can cry. When they cry, somebody goes in and picks them up, changes their diaper, feeds them, burps them, hugs them, plays with them. Whatever that infant needed, their needs are met. This is a child who is happy. This is a child who has that sense of trust because somebody goes and gets them. Now, there are times in many different sort of situations where there's mistrust. And this is the infant that doesn't get picked up. It could be uh, a multi-child family, um, could be a family, you know, that maybe there's drug use or abuse or something's going on in there. And this child is not, it's being neglected. So the child is laying there in a wet diaper and hungry. And after a while, this child is not going to cry anymore because crying doesn't get anybody there. And you can actually tell that infant, you know, who just doesn't cry, you know, and, and it looks at you like, oh, you picked me up like if they're in the hospital, you know, you'll know something's going on. So trust needs are always met. Mistrust, nobody's coming to pick them up or they're very irregular on uh, how their needs are being met. Piaget, initially, is all about the touching in the mouth and moving things, sensor and motor. It's learning how that they can get things and make things work. That is birth through about two years old. Then we go to pre-operational concrete and um, formal operations. And let me go into something more about it. So 
In the beginning, Piaget talks about sensory and motor. And it talks about these, what we call primary circular reactions. And what it is, is, see this example? A child may suck his or her thumb by accident. And then they realize, ooh, that gives me comfort. Let me put it back in there again. So it happens by accident and then they learn. Or, you know, they learn if they look at mommy, even at four months old, and let's say they coo or smile, mommy's gonna have a reaction, go, oh, look at that. So they'll continue to do that behavior because of the reaction they get from it. At four to eight months, you know, it's that imitation, like mom's looking at you and sticking your tongue out and cooing and you are, you know, back and forth with them or playing. And, you know, we're talking about these schemas, you know, and it's things that happen in order for something to happen. For instance, you're looking something, you're reaching, you're grabbing it, and then you realize you can pick up a rattle. Like, why am I doing these things reaching out? Boop, there it is. I got that rattle. So body image, you know, infants understand things quicker than you really know. I mean, working in pediatrics for so many years, even young infants surprise me um, how smart they really are. Object permanence, I talk, talked to you about last week, is you show them a toy, let's say it's the rattle, and then it's behind another toy and they're on tummy time. They know that that rattle is still there somewhere and then they go looking for it. That's object permanence. As they get older, it's the kid, you take their fire truck or their car and you put it in the toy chest and cover it up. Well, you don't see it, but the kid still knows that that toy is still there for them, okay? They also are start um, learning about um, moving things and the sounds things make and you know rolling things. They start through um, either people showing them or by accident they do it and they remember things. They're learning so much so quick to become these little young children that can do things. They can walk, they can run, they can feed themselves, pick up things, play with things. These are all learned things children have to do. When you put a mirror in front of a child, initially they touch it, they play with it. They don't know what to do with, gee, who is that in that mirror? And it's usually you'll have mom in the background also helping. <clears throat> Excuse me. Attachment. We know that young infants, many of them don't want to go to anybody else. You know, usually it's mom or dad or grandma or grandpa, whoever's there all the time, they want to be with them. If, for instance, you now all of a sudden have to take your child to daycare, and that first day of daycare is always so rough because you have to take your infants, usually anywhere from three to six months, and you have to hand it to somebody else. And that kid turns around and wants to reach for you. They, they are really anxious and they will cry, you know, and it breaks mommy's and daddy's heart when you have to drop those kids off at daycare. But it's just part of children and they're the way that they are. Many times strangers try to come up and, you know, talk to your child or touch your child and they just completely turn around, don't want to look at them. You know, they, they try to get away, like, who are you? Don't touch me, right? Also, as they get older, they know that the stranger will still be there. Now they're going to peek around to see if they're there, to see if they'll do it again and to make it a game. Language starts with cooing and crying. That's their first. They start playing. I mean, initially, it's just that rattle looking at it. And of course, in the mouth, always. You know, there's all different ways to look at temperament in children, all sorts of questionnaires and forums and whatever. But as I said, if all needs are met, like Erickson says, that's going to be a happy baby. Now, the toddler. <clears throat> You know, I think of all the children, I think I like toddlers the best. I think toddlers ages one to three are my dive bomb kids. 
These kids have no fear. There's no filter and they are going to try to do what they want to do when they want to do it. And this Jerry Seinfeld quote, having a two-year-old is like having a blender without a lid. They're everywhere, all at the same time. And you really have to watch them. Intense environmental exploration. You know, their fingers are everywhere, opening everything into everything. You know, and our goal is just to keep them protected. The problem with toddlers, though, they need to be able to explore. And as parents, we need to give them that ability. And the only way they shouldn't explore is if it's something that is going to hurt them. So what goes on with toddlers? Well, they have a slower weight gain. Of course, that triple birth weight, that's it. That's all it does first year. It's going to do be more like Getting taller, leveling out, gaining weight. Getting taller, leveling out, gaining weight. And it's a stair step that's going up. It is not all at once. And it, just know that it slows down. We know at this point in toddlers, the head circumference should not be bigger than their chest. It should be equal to or less than. As newborns, we know it's bigger. Their body systems now are starting to get more mature. We know that in toddlers, as I said, toddlers get together and even in their own house, what are they doing? Everything in their mouth, explore the world in their mouth. So germs, they swapping spit with the whole world, right? Everything in their mouth. They go to the grocery store, mouth right on that little push cart, right? This is what toddlers do. And is it bad? Is it good? Well, they're being exposed to germs and they're building up their immune system. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't clean it off, et cetera. But these little sicknesses that they're getting is actually making them stronger uh, until they get to be um, in kindergarten. They're going to be respiratory, ear infections, and tonsils, right? Everything in the mouth. Mouth is connected to the ears. So Exploring their world through their mouth has consequences. Also, now in toddlers, we're going to start with the potty training. They're going to be able to hold at one point, get there, go to, you know, go pee pee in the potty. And, you know, that's the first thing that happens. And then, of course, hopefully they'll be able to um, have their uh, BMs in the bathroom too. I mean, this picture, I think it's so cute. It's, you know, daddy or grandpa sitting there trying to show their little granddaughter or, or, or daughter, mm, this is how you do it. Because, I mean, if you think of where we put our little portable potties for our kids, they're usually in the living room. I mean, I've walked into many friends' room and where are they? Right in front of the couch. So if they're potty training, they're potty training right in the living room. Is that wrong? No, it's showing them there's a place to go. Gross and fine motor development. So it continues to become more coordinated between the ages of two to three years. This is where it's becoming more of just that walk. We're running better. We're not falling over as much. We're able to um, use both hands and we're able to throw a ball by 18 months. Now, some of them do it earlier, some of them do it later, as long as we're getting there, we're okay. So I've told you about when an infant is small, there's what we call binocular vision, it means one eye and the other eye, and they, they're not matching, which means there's no depth perception. Now, at this point, toddlers, they're starting to have that depth perception. Those eyes are starting to work better together. Um, they are starting to be able to have better motor coordination. Now, as infants, have you ever eaten cereal and those little fruit and meat things that they have? I think they taste horrible, but infants love them and they eat it down. As they become infants, their, their taste, their smell becomes different. So things that they used to like, 
they're not going to like anymore. As I said, I, I can tell you how many toddlers parents told me they only eat chicken nuggets and macaroni and cheese and apple juice. And that is many, many children. Of course, you should be, you know, offering everything, but usually that's what they know you'll eat. They go into this physiologic anorexia. They don't need much to survive. You know, they eat less food than you really think they do. As long as they're gaining weight, remember it's slower. They're gaining weight, they're getting taller, we're doing okay. And they explore the world through their senses. I mean, whether it's sticking their hands into all sorts of finger paints, food, smooshing their stuff on their high chairs, this is all part of growth and development. And they should be able to do those things. So Erickson, we talk about autonomy versus shame and doubt. And this is what the kid does. No, no, mine, mine, no, mine. And that is always their conversation. They want to, everything is no, whether it's yes or no, they're always going to say no. And it's all going to be, it's mine. They'll be playing with other kids and it's mine, it's mine. Now, how do we make an infant feel secure? It's that ritual. That means putting a child on a schedule, same things, same times, all the times. That ritualism really, really helps. Now, as we get to Piaget, so now is what we're doing is we are sensor and motor, and then we get into more cognitive um, processes. So remember, cognitive is all about how to think, how to be logical. We know that at this point, they're gonna start to experiment, which means you show them a truck, concrete, that it moves. They're gonna take that truck, move it up the ceiling, up the, the couch, up wherever it wants to go, and maybe a truck with another truck. So now they say, well, the car has wheels too, and this has wheels. They're starting to put things together. Now, the one thing again uh, about autonomy versus shame and doubt. Now, shame and doubt, what is that all about? They want to be able to try to do things. Now, this is something I know even I did. I would like stop my kids from do things. I would do things for the child because it was easier to do. You need to allow the child to do things, to let them perform tasks. It might take longer. Ages one to three, they should be able to put their shoes on by the end of this. They should be able to get dressed, even if it's inside out and backwards. Allow them to do things even if it takes more time. You need to give them that ability to be autonomous, okay? Now, also, children tend to do things that may not be uh, good. For instance, as I call dive bomb. Dive bombing from the top of the couch, dive bombing to the chair next door. They may miss, okay? But you need to allow them to try things. Of course, unless it might hurt them. It's the only thing they don't want to do. So when we talk about um, Erickson, it's that ability to do things for themselves and the parents allowing them to do it gives them more confidence in themselves. Now, Piaget. Piaget is the type that says, Okay, I found my finger and now I'm sucking it. Mm, that gives me pleasure. I found it this time, but now I'm going to buy myself. Oh, there's a finger again. Let me suck on it and let me do that. Also, when all of a sudden they have that voluntary grasp, they grab that rattle. And now that rattle, oh, it made a noise. Let me do it again. And that is that secondary circular. And the tertiary is how many... Um, children at that ages of one, one and a half. They're sitting at their high chairs. They take their sippy cup and they throw it on the floor. Why? Because mom went in the kitchen to do something. They want mommy there and they know throwing it on the floor, mommy's going to come and pick it up for them. 
They know how to run us. They know what they want. These are part of what Piaget says. It's cognitively being aware how to control their situations. Now, there's differences between pre-operational and concrete operational, okay? So pre-operational is when you figure things out, figures can go in, you suck them, you can throw things on the floor, mommy will come. Concrete is now when you start getting a little bit more rational, logical in your thinking. We're starting to know that if there are two glasses of water, and if you take the one glass of water, pour it in a different cup, we're gonna know that that's still the same amount of water, but it looks different in, in a different type of cup. Or a piece of clay, it's one piece of clay, you make it two pieces of clay, still the same amount of clay. They're starting to understand this, becoming more rational in what they think. As toddlers, they start to understand that they have a penis or a vagina. They're starting to understand. And they also say that you should use um, words you know, that are, you know, real words, not, you know, whatever, you know, uh, words you want for either. Um, they start touching themselves. And, you know, what I do is you want to touch yourself, go in your room. I don't want to watch you. And a one to three-year-old will understand that. Okay, as they get older, they understand more and touching themselves is not a bad thing. I mean, it's their body, they're exploring, they're seeing what's there, right? They also start understanding by the end of toddler, there's boys and there's girls, that you don't have a penis, I do, because I'm a boy and you're a girl. These are sort of things that you start to hear. They're starting to understand that there are differences between people, between moms, dads, they're different. Mom does things different than dad, but still it is okay. They're still the same. They're also um, understanding when they do things right. Um, you know, how they can put their shoes by the front door now, simple tasks. You know, we can use things uh, for comfort, like teddy bears and blankets, or, you know, um, if we're teaching them things in the social environment, using a doll to let them dress is, is very important. You know, we could see what you're going to do to me if it's a procedure. Toddlers start talking more and more, and sometimes you'd wish they stopped talking. I mean, we know by one years old, it's usually two word phrases, you know, mommy, daddy, grandma, grandpa, pop, pop. I mean, I'm Nana and we have pop, pop in this house, but they start to understand more and they start to try to express what they want, you know, so that forces them to learn more words. They want to learn independence. Remember what Erickson says, they want to learn how to do things. And we need to give them that uh, ability. Feeding themselves, even if the food's upside, the spoon is upside down trying to use it, they're trying. Don't say turn it the other way, that's the wrong way. You know, allow them to give them that ability to make those attempts to try how to dress, how to undress. And the one thing that I think is, is um, amazing for a one to three year old do understand other feelings. Now I have rheumatoid arthritis and I remember one day sitting on the couch with an ice bag on my knee, it really hurt. And my little grandson, I think he was two at the time, came over and he kissed my knee and he goes, boo-boo, all better. Boo-boo, all better. And at two years old, for him to understand that I hurt and have feelings for it, they do understand very early in life. Again, play, I can't tell you more about play. How do children learn? How do they learn how to use things? How to take this thing and that thing and make them work together, become more and more logical. How to work with other people, other children, how to get along with the environment. Very, very important. You know, whether it's playing with other kids, other adults, or mom or dad. <clears throat> Again, make sure they have the proper toys that's age appropriate. 
And again, playing next to each other, imitating whatever another person's doing, or just something that has to do with tactile, like finger painting. I think kids love finger painting. I remember as a kid, the smell of the paint when I was a kid, it was just so much fun and sticking in there and going over and then your hands would be all different colors. When you're toilet training, the kid needs to show you that they're ready. Some kids by year old could be toilet trained and some kids aren't toilet trained to three years old and there's nothing you can do to push them. You can continue the same rituals and routines, but when a kid's ready, the kid will be ready. Now, this picture here, the second picture, the boy smiling backwards on the toilet. I want you to know that helped me with my grandson. I didn't have urine squirted all over my floor. And I didn't know that with my son because I have a son and a daughter. So I used it for him and it worked. And I didn't have big messes to clean up when he was at my house and it works well. And then the kid can sit there with his penis and play with the water and squirt it around, you know, and making little circles, whatever they have to do. It does help them want to go and urinate in the bathroom. So toilet training, again, make it play and we'll have fun. We know if there's other kids in the house, there's gonna be rivalry. You know, you love him better than you love me. You know, those sort of things. Or if a kid screaming and yelling for attention because you're with the other child, it's just part of life that, you know, um, it has to be just explained. I love you just as much as I love him, but let me deal with this and then me and you will do something. Part of the temper tantrums toddler has. And then, <clears throat> the one thing about temper tantrums, I, I think going to the grocery store, if they're not in the cart and they're on the ground and they're walking around with you and all of a sudden they want something and you can't get it or wh whatever the reason, and then they just lay on the floor and scream and yell, what should you do? Well, walk away from it, ignore it, unless it's something that's causing, that will hurt him. If it's going to cause him harm, of course, you don't want that. But let, let him have a temper tantrum because then he knows he can't do it. But if you're paying attention, it's going to do it again. Again, I told you me, 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 me do. They want to be able to do those things, you know, and it's no. Everything is no and everything is no. It's just part of it. And we know if a child, let's say is three-year-old, something stressful is going on with their life, we know that these children can regress. Hopefully that turned it off, sorry. But we know if a child is under stress, they do regress. What do I mean by regress? Well, might be a child who's potty trained, who now isn't. Or it could be that they're not using the pacifier anymore, but there's a brand new sister in the house and they take theirs and put it in their mouth. They regress or suck their finger, or maybe they want that blanket or that toy they used to have. Regression happens at all ages, even adolescents do it. So regression is that way that they cope with stress. So refining coordination, fine motor development and throwing a ball, all of these um, are really important. You know, how do we refine coordination? Well, between two to three years old. That means when they're walking, they're not as clumsy and back and forth. They're, you know, walking and running a little bit, you know, um, quote, more normal, less clumsily. You know, we know fine motor and that hand to hand, 18 months, and we're gonna throw a ball in there also. Social development, well, Kids actually like to be around other children. And we know children of different languages can play and they don't even know each other's language, but they know how to communicate. So at one year old, we know that there's a one word sentence by two. And sometimes at one year, you might see two words, but the book says one. By age two, they're multi words. They're telling you things that they want and they're gonna want to feed themselves. They're gonna want to play, dress and undress themselves because they want that praise from mommy too. That's part of what Kohlberg says about, I wanna do 
for me because I want mommy to say, well, you've done such a great job. Again, you know, the parallel play, the imitation, the tactile play. So car seats are important. We know all children must be rear facing until two years old, and then you could put them forward facing. If we're having car seats, make sure that they're not old. They're not from your 10 year old um, son, that uh, that's not a good choice. I mean, it should be uh, maybe a gently used, maybe your friend had a car seat that's a month old. Well, what's wrong with that? Uh, but just making sure that it's rear facing at first and that we aren't using old car seats because they do expire. You know, the funny part is, you see that little box there? I remember being in that when I was a kid. <laughs> so that shows you how much things have changed. And now let's go to preschool, ages three to five. Three to five, this is when these kids start to their learning process of learning how to read and colors and letters. And um, this is an extremely important time in their life. It prepares them to separate from the family and go to school for a certain amount of times. Many kids, yeah, they might have been in daycare, but there are kids that aren't. So this is that real formal separation where they're expected to do something, not just daycare and play and eat snacks and lunch, okay? So how do we prepare these children for what's coming next? Well, we need to read to these children daily. You know, my grandson gets four books every night. He talks his mom into it. And this kid at age five can read, he can do his numbers, his letters. I mean, it's really, I can see such a great difference in his um, education because of just reading books. Also, giving a child a positive attitude, like we need to do our letters today because you're gonna go to school. School is fun. And you wanna teach the teacher how to do these things again. I'm making a play and fun out of all of these sort of things. We know at school uh, and getting them ready, preschool even, they have to cooperate with other children, with the teacher, they need to follow rules and they're separated um, from their family. And they're gonna have to sit for periods of time they've never done before. So um, getting them ready is so important. Again, everything slows down. Everything is still slow. They're not gaining a lot of weight, still about five pounds, a couple inches a year. We know the body systems, heart rate, et cetera, gonna slow down a little bit more until we get to be an adult. Gross motor, gross motor, they're walking, running, climbing, and jumping. One foot, two feet, don't matter. Fine motor, it's that hand to muscle coordination. What about buttoning a shirt, right? That'd be really good, fine motor. They can dress themselves, they can draw. And many times they're getting inside the lines. They're getting better and better as they get a little bit older. Now, Erickson. Erickson is about a sense of initiative, okay? And this is when they are trying to do tasks. Um, they are aware that everybody's a little different, okay? They also know right and wrong now. It is a part of what um, Erickson says. So they're like knowing what they need to do to get good praise because it's good stuff or they know what's gonna get them on timeout. They, they know at this uh, period of time. They're getting ready for school. And by kindergarten, um, these children, you know, again, getting that positive attitudes towards learning to read to them, you know, and then if they're not in a daycare, they're not in preschool, how about putting them in maybe gymnastics or a sports team, get them with other kids so they can learn how to cooperate with other children. Piaget, at this point in time, they are really starting to learn a lot more. 
Um, they're starting to learn about their language and how to make sentences with time. They don't understand two o'clock in the afternoon. They understand after lunch. They understand um, when you wake up. I know that my grandson, it was here. I had to say, you can stay with me for two morning times, which means he wakes up and it's morning two times. That's how many days he would stay with me. He didn't understand the day. He understood morning times, okay? And then they're magical, magical thinking. Ever watch a kid who's about four or five years old sit there with cars or with dolls and they're talking to them and playing with them and making their own little game, even if they're alone or if they're an other kid, they're making their own sort of rules of what to do. It's all this magical, magical thinking. Now, Kohlberg. I think Kohlberg really at this point, understanding right and wrong, really starts um, the moral development in Kohlberg. Now, children know if they do something right, they're gonna be praised. Wow, you put your clothes in the laundry and you got dressed, what a great job. Now the shirt's inside out, backwards, or maybe the shorts are on, you know, backwards. They did it, that is the praise they're looking for. But they know if they've done something wrong that there's going to be a consequence for that. So when you look at Kohlberg, anytime you look at Kohlberg, know that there's right and wrong and a consequence for each, whether it's a good consequence or a bad consequence. Again, they're still developing their sexuality. You know, at this point, um, they are um, children, girls like daddies and boys like mommies. It's just that attachment. I know uh, my father and I, till the day he died, I had six brothers, but me and my daddy were the closest together. It's just something that continued through life. It's just part of it. As they get, you know, into this sort of stage, they're gonna be exploring themselves a lot more. They're going to question, where did that belly come from? You know, and it's trying to understand. Another thing is, you know, earlier in their ages, you didn't care if they got undressed, went into the shower or the bath, who was looking, but now close the door, don't look. Or they're in the bathroom, close the door, they become more modest. They are um, not needing the much, that ritual, that schedule, as well as toddlers. They can handle it better. They can handle stress better, okay? Toddlers need that routine. Your preschoolers do not need it as much. They can dress themselves. They love to please. And remember, they are accepting whatever the family's culture is. You know, if you go to church every Sunday, you know, and it's Christmas, they know, you know, the religious aspect of Christmas. If the family is the type that puts up a Christmas tree and has presents, they've never been in church, they know Santa Claus is coming. Whatever ritual it is that the family's done, they're going to understand. The other thing they do is they start challenging you know, their code of conduct. They're gonna start pushing you. They're going to try to do as much as they can, um, knowing, trying to see how much they can get before they get in trouble. Play, we've talked about it. Associative play is playing with another person, but um, no rules. There's no winner. It's like, make it up as you go. Im imitative, you're doing what somebody else is doing. Imaginative, now very, very common for preschoolers to have imaginary playmates. But if they get to, to school age and they're eight years old and still have an imaginary playmate, that's a problem. But at this age, they can have their imaginary playmates. Dramatic play, as I said, we use that a lot when you're talking about children, things have happened, we wanna find out what happened. This dramatic play, it's used a lot in the medical community, you know, looking for abuse, uh, whether it's physical or, or um, sexual abuse, we can find it out. And of course, mutual play is playing together. 
fears. They're afraid of the dark. It's like, we'll turn on the lights. Well, no, there's a boogeyman there. A ghost is gonna come get me. This is so part of this preschooler ages and they don't wanna be alone. If they're in the house and you've gone outside in the backyard and they can't buy you, they're gonna be crying and screaming, looking for you. They don't wanna be alone. They're also afraid of dogs, big dogs, big cats, big, big anything. They're afraid that they're gonna eat them up. So it's some of these things that we need to um, understand. I mean, objects are people associated with pain. Well, hello, future nurses we're the people, so they are afraid of us. So again, it's breaking the ice that we can talk to them. So in sexual education, just find out what the kid knows before you start explaining a big dissertation about where babies come from. You know, and again, I say use those correct anatomic words. Um, it stops um, a lot of doubt when they hear other words from other people. And you will see these preschooler children, masturbation is extremely common. Again, tell them to go to their room. You don't need to be playing with yourself in front of me. Go to your room and make it as simple as that. I have seen that, you know, sometimes you have children that have animals that will be rubbing it against themselves. room. I've seen it before. So what would I do? Well, I'm just going to say, you know, I'll be back in a couple minutes. I'm not going to bring attention to it. It's perfectly normal. Let them finish what they're doing, come back in five minutes. And that's that. So this kid doesn't feel like they've done something wrong because it's not wrong. Oops, again. A lot of stuff. Any questions? All right, let's get going. <clears throat> so Kahoot.it number nine one two two zero seven. Again, if you put your names and you're coming to me and you want to do some tutoring, I could go back and look at cahoots and see what questions you might have gotten wrong and I can help you with it. So what do would you like? Yes. Can I, go, can, I, can I make an appointment like for like the mask art tutoring? Would you do Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Please send me a message, Esther. Okay, I will. Thank you. You're very welcome. You know, I was a pharmacology teacher for about four years, and I actually got dosage calculation down to a science. Now, it is not dimensional analysis at that. There's just too many things you keep putting down. But I've made three formulas does everything. So I will show it to you. Thank you so much. Yes, I would love that. I'm, I'm going to send you a... A recording and three worksheets. You do that first, then you come to me and I'll go over it with you, okay? Thank you. You're very welcome. All right, let's get going. Week two, infant, toddlers, and preschooler. It's gonna be week 10 before you turn around. A multi-select types of play considered to be sense pleasure play. You know, when you think of sense, think about things you touch, right? Is it hard? Is it soft? Plain and sand and finger painting. Absolutely, this is all about sense pleasure. It's taking that sand, playing with it, touching it, mud, water, all of these things, finger painting. <clears throat> what type of play is considered cooperative play?
Remember cooperative play, it's two children or more together and there is a winner, there is an outcome. So play in checkers, there is somebody who wins. According to Kohlberg, pre-conventional level of moral development, a preschooler who has moral reasoning, what do they get? <clears throat> what does he talk about, Kohlberg? Kohlberg is good and bad consequence for each. Whether it's good and consequences that you want good consequences, good job or bad, uh, time out, dude, that's it. Get in there now. There are consequences for either. Which nursing action is appropriate to teach a preschool aged about a scheduled procedure? So you have a kid that you need to maybe um, do uh, a CAT scan. You know, putting these kids in these donuts and these noise going on can really be scary. Preschooler ages three to five. Use a doll, use a doll. Remember when you go into these kids at first, do nothing, minimal touch. Then get on their level by telling them, wow, what a cool shirt or something or give them a sticker. Then let them touch the equipment and use a doll. There is a process that you have to go through. Now, if you can walk in and touch a kid right away, not going to happen. A multi select. What are some findings from a pediatric physical assessment? Remember, there's history and there's physical. Again, remember the one thing I can tell you read questions carefully. <clears throat> So growth, we can touch it, we can see it, review the body systems, we can listen to the lungs and whatever, and we could take a temperature. Those are all touching. The family medical history is a history, has nothing to do with physical, okay? Before performing a physical assessment on a toddler, the nurse should do what to encourage cooperation? <clears throat> So at first, minimal contact, right? They're scared of you. Remember, you inflict pain. They know you from, you know, going to the doctor's offices. You're, you're the bad guy. Minimal at first, then break the ice and then let them touch things and using dolls to help describe things is so good. What would you suspect if you note that an infant's chin is quivering, their fists are clenched and they're inconsolable? What do you think that is? It's all about pain. What if they're shaking their head and touching their head like that? Isn't that the location of the pain is probably an earache? So think about those things. Pain is something you are going to see. Med surge, zams, hesis, and then clexes. Multi-select. Erickson describes infants as trust versus mistrust. What does trust mean? So trust is Somebody, an uh, infant who's happy. They're happy so they feel secure. They predict what's coming and their needs are always met. And remember, this is your happy baby because they don't cry a lot because they don't need to because somebody's gonna meet their needs. Very important concept. You will see probably the most described of all of the theorists is Erickson's infants and Erickson's school age. 
These are the two things I've seen all over your NCLEX. Students have come back to me and tell me, and I know they're on HESI's, okay? So very important to understand Erickson, those ones. A three-year-old child is having an outpatient procedure. How would you help the child be less fearful? Three-year-old children. Remember, three-year-olds like things concrete. They like to be able to have that visual, right? And we do that by giving them a doll, give them a stuffed animal, show them what needs to be done, that concrete. I mean, this is, you know, part of what Piaget says. They need to see it. They can't rationalize. They're not logical yet. Multi-select. You need to do an assessment on an infant and you walk into the room and the infant's asleep in the mother's arms. Well, what are you gonna do now? You know, this is the best time to listen to heart and lung sounds. It is the best time because they're not crying. Ever tried to do heart and lung sounds on an infant who's awake and cooing and crying? You can't hear a thing. So that's when I would do that assessment. When do you switch formula to whole milk? Well, we know we switch and put foods in at six months. <clears throat> and it's at one year old at one year it's whole milk and it, it's not you know uh one percent two percent no they need the fat they need that nutrition so at 12 months whole milk i'll multi-select when teaching about car seats for a newborn infant So gently use car seats, less than a year from a friend. You know it's not been an accident, it's your friend. Rear facing, of course. And of course, new car seats are always the best. But none of these old things from a sister or from your next door neighbor, no. Garage sale, no. Multi-select. When and how do you introduce solid foods to infants? You know, that picture reminds me of my son after he ate dinner every night. He would love to smear his stuff head to toe. And that's why bath time was always after dinner. And I didn't realize I was doing good by letting him play that tactile. <laughs> so introduce foods at six months, one at a time, four to seven days in between adding another one. And it doesn't matter, fruits, vegetables, you know, cereal, whatever your pediatrician says. Before assessing a four-year-old child, what techniques would you use to approach this child? So we know number one, minimal touch at first, right? Do something like, yeah, man, that Batman shirt's really cool. I just got one for my grandson or, oh, wow, those curls in your hair are cute. Or, you know, those sneakers got lights. Do you run fast on them? Do something. Get them that you don't feel like a threat. I mean, that's why I always had a stack of stickers in my pocket. Princess stickers, Batman, SpongeBob, whatever I needed, I had them. What technique can be used to examine a toddler?
So play, play, play. So you walked in minimal touch. You broke open their ice, maybe gave them a sticker and liked their sneakers. Now we need to start doing things. You let them play with all of your equipment and then you start playing. So is this your ears? And maybe they know your ears are here. So you make it fun, make it play. Kids love to play. When assessing a healthy child's lymph nodes, what would you expect? So kids healthy, it's not sick. Goes to the doctor's office, he's feeling those lymph nodes. What should he feel? And the answer is nothing. Should not feel them if he's sick. If he's sick, you might feel these swollen lymph nodes. But if he is healthy, they should be non-palpable. Good. Good job. Which Erickson stage of developmental levels would be used for a toddler? Remember, this is where they want to do things and mommies don't sometimes let them do it. And it's called autonomy versus shame and doubt. They want to do it by themselves, but they really don't know because mommy won't let them. So that's the shame and doubt. What pain scale would you use on a three-year-old child? So three-year-old child is a preschool child. So three-year-old is now faces, flack is below three. That is your nonverbal or from newborn up to the ages of three. I switched the question this time on you. So faces starts at preschool, multi-select. Erickson's autonomy versus shame and doubt is used to describe toddlers. What does this mean? So autonomy, shame, and doubt. What does this mean? Well, you let the child try. Let them try to do things. Uh, very important. And, you know, new things, let them try. That shame is when you don't let them. And then they feel shameful because, you know, they can't and you won't let them. And they want to try because they want to be autonomous. They want to do things for themselves. A two-year-old boy is playing with dirt and mud. What type of play is this? And that is sense pleasure. Very good. You listen to me. Good job. A parent of an 18-month-old boy says he says no, no, no to everything and has really rapid mood swings. Why? why? Why is he doing that? Absolutely normal. It's all about me, 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 and no, no, no. Absolutely, good job. What is descriptive of a preschooler's understanding of time? Somebody told you my grandson, how many days can I stay here? And I go, two morning times. He understood what morning was. The sun came up. So it's time with events, after your nap, before lunch, when you wake up, whatever it is, it is an event with the, that time. They don't understand two in the afternoon. They don't get that. 
A four-month-old infant's crying and shaking their head. What type of pain is this infant showing? And that's location. They're shaking their head. There's something in the head going on because that's not normal. I mean, if their leg is going up and down, something's going on too. You can figure out sometimes where the location is just by what they're showing you. A one month old infant's back of their head is flat. What would you tell the mother? I mean, we are back to sleep to prevent SIDS death. Again, tummy time uh, is a great time when they are wide awake and alert and that will help because their skulls are so soft and malleable and, and they'll stop being flat, they really do. Infants crawl before they walk. This pattern of growth and development is called what? They lift their head and they turn over, they turn over, then they're on their knees and they're on their knees before they're creeping around and they're creeping before they're walking. What is that? It's called sequential trends because it happens in a sequence, okay? Sequence, it happens in a sequence. How do you communicate with parents that do not speak a language that you know? Okay, never have somebody, you know, family or anything interpret for you. Always get that telephone interpreter, or if you have one of your nurses or physicians, they can, but that telephone interpreter works really, really well. I've used it many times. What age would most children could understand under, on top of, beside, around, and back of, over, beside, all these things? These is the concept that's um, hard. Go look underneath the couch for your shoes. Your cup's on top of the table over there. And that's about four years old. I mean, it's not to say some three-year-olds don't get it because I understand that, but the book, four years old, okay? I'm sorry if you have children, don't think that you know children anymore. Know the book, okay? That's always been my difficulty also. In terms of language and cognitive development, a four-year-old child should be expected to do what? A four-year-old, this is a preschooler. What should they be able to do? And you're talking cognitive, you are talking about Piaget. Take your shoes and go put them by the front door. Get your dirty laundry, put them in the hamper. Simple commands. Put your cup in the sink. Simple things like this a four-year-old should be expected to do. They don't think abstract. They need to have concrete. They need to see it, okay? They don't understand conservation of matter. Um, others' perspective, no. They can barely understand what they know at this point in time. They're starting to put A and B together and get C. They're not up to D and E yet. What pain scale would you use to assess the pain of a toddler? Toddler, age is what? One up to the age of three. And that's the flat scale. Faces are after the age of three, preschooler, toddler, flack, preschooler, faces. A multi-select. What safety instructions would you teach the parents of a six month old child? Well, safety is, well, what is this child doing? Growth and development, what is this kid able to do? What do you need to help these parents understand?
So again, rear facing, absolutely. Cover those electrical outlets, absolutely. And again, putting them on the changing table, you know, and walking away without buckled in, there's a problem, they will fall off. And introducing foods one at a time, four to seven days apart. Multi-select. What are the cognitive characteristics of a child? ages two to seven in the pre-operational stage. So remember, in this stage, things are concrete. They uh, understand what they can see, all right? So they can see a car moves, they'll move it. And then they'll be imaginative with it. They can take a broom and ride it like a horsey, but they have no clue about somebody else and the way they feel. So remember, when you talk pre-operational, think it's concrete. They've been shown it. Not that they had to figure it out, They've been shown it, it's concrete, they can see it, they can touch it. A nurse receives a phone call about her six week old baby. He's crying a lot every day and what can she do? Tell you a little something about the first six weeks of um, an infant. Any child who was six weeks old who had issues, fevers or crying, it was always considered an emergency because we don't know what's going on and there is no defense. So six weeks old, crying a lot, you cannot give any information over the phone. You don't know what's happening. They need to come in, we need to examine that child. It could be something simple, could be reflux, could be colic, but it could be a lot more. This is a child that you cannot mess around with. They have really no immune system and they really need to be looked at very closely, okay? A multi-select. What should an infant be able to do at nine months old? So these are all sort of gross motor, right? except for that rattle, should they be able to sit at nine months with support, pull themselves up on their feet or roll completely over? Well, they should be able to by six months old, roll completely over front to back, back to front. Sitting with support, no, without support is what they need to do um, at eight months old. Hold the rattle, absolutely, and then pull themselves up and like creep around, you know, the couch or the coffee table. Good. Developmental levels are difficult. The first expected fine motor developmental milestone for an infant begins with what? The first F, fingers, fine motor. So they should be able to have that reflex, first fine motor reflex, second voluntary, okay? Put your finger in their hands and they're gonna grasp it. A toddler's parent asks the nurse for suggestions on dealing with temper tantrums. Kid in the grocery store slams on the floor and starts screaming, yelling and kicking. What are you gonna do? We do absolutely nothing with that behavior. I'm going to ignore it as long as the kid's not going to hurt himself, okay? Because if we always take, and it's normal for toddlers to have temper tantrums, it's because no, 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 me, 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 I want it now. That's what a toddler does. So ignore the behavior. Because if you go and you recognize that behavior, they're going to do it again and again and again. They want your attention. A two-year-old has difficulty with activity, sensory, 
sensitivity, and only speaks one word responses. How are you going to assess a child like that? I mean, when you look at these sort of difficulties this child is having, and the big one that hits me the biggest is sensory sensitivity. Children with autism do not like to be touched. They don't like you in your space. Usually their speech is delayed, you know, and they don't like to participate with group activities, usually by themselves. And there is a checklist there. So just wanna let you know for children that are off the scale, there are ways to look at them and, and see where they are. Parents are concerned her eight month old child's not developing like their older child. What is normal for eight months? <clears throat> At eight months old, they should be able to sit alone unsupported, pull themselves to a sitting position as about 10, uh, 10 months. Um, later on. So blocks into a container, actually it's about 11 months. First steps, they say about 12 months. It's according to book. What fine motor skill is expected of a four-year-old child? Fine motor, fingers, F, fine. Again, be careful. Gross motor and fine motor, they are different. They should be able to button a shirt. Skipping his motor, tying shoelaces. No, not till they're about six. Walk upstairs. Again, that is gross motor. Buttoning a shirt. A multi-select. What gross motor skills should a four-year-old be able to do? And they should be able to walk in down the stairs eat with both feet and then hop or one or two feet, doesn't matter. Jumping rope is later on um, with that one. Of course, with tying the shoelaces, that's fine motor, but hopping on one or two feet. Are in doing the developmental screening on a 10 month old should expect which fine motor skills. <clears throat> Remember F, fine fingers again. So this is, they should be able to grasp that handle and they should be able to use that pincer by 10 months. About seven months, it's more crude, but now it's more fine and they can get it. They want it, they go grab that rattle. Frequent developmental assessments are important for which reason? <clears throat> so we do all these assessments because we want to see where there's delays are. And then what do we do when we find them? Well, we report them. And then if we need to do an investigation or early, invent, early intervention, physical therapy, speech therapy, whatever they need, we can get it to them. A multi-select. An infant searches for her toy that is not in sight. What is that called? So that is being able to explore by themselves. That of course is memory development, but the overall name is object permanence. Good job. 
The natu natural physical developmental sequence that most children follow is what? What do they do first? You can see how I had some of these questions last week. I bring them in now, and now you're able to understand them. So we lift the head, roll over, creep, crawl, cruise, and we walk. And that should be, according to the book, by 12 months old. A multi-select. What would alert the nurse to hold digoxin on an infant she's caring for? Hold digoxin, what? I mean, these are reasons why you need to understand the difference in vital signs for all different ages. The one thing that doesn't change is potassium or digoxin level. Those will always be there. Heart rate in 90 is way too low. And bounty peripheral pulses it has nothing to do with digoxin. In general, an infant should triple their birth weight at about what months of age? And we know that is going to be at 12 months, they should triple. When an infant's toes spread when the soles of their feet are stroked, what is that called? It's just like adults, they have the same reflexes here. So yes, Babinski, now rooting, when you take and you stroke the cheek and they go for you, either the breast or a bottle, it helps with feeding. Startle is when their hands come up when you make a loud noise. And grasping, of course, is when voluntary and voluntary grasping. These are reflexes we look at. When entering an infant's room, the door slams shut and the infant jerks and starts to cry. What is this reflex called? Now I said startle, which would be it, but it's not one of these names here because you can use either name and it's called Moro reflex. Moro or startle are the same, loud noise and they respond. A four-year-old is reluctant to take their medicine. What intervention should the nurse take? Now four-year-olds can be stubborn. These are your preschoolers. You're just going to use a straightforward approach. You will never put it in with food or juice unless it's a tiny little amount to get it in there. If you put it in their bottle and they don't drink the whole bottle, how much medicine did they take? So straightforward, what do I mean? Well, would you like a pill or would you like liquid? If you want liquid, do you want it in a spoon, a cup, or a syringe? Straightforward, that's all you're gonna ask, okay? Four-year-olds will manipulate the situation. Only give them choices, this is your choice, this or this. Which intervention helps a hospitalized toddler feel a sense of control? Well, what did I tell you about toddlers? What helps them feel comfortable? Same routine, ritualization, remember? Same routine, same feeding, same bedtime, same foods, all of that will make that child feel a lot better. When assessing a two and a half year old toddler, what findings should you report to the provider?
If their head is bigger than their chest, there's a problem. Remember, they're born with big heads. And by a year and a half, too, that chest should be bigger than the head or at least equal to it. There's something going on, something in that head that's not right. A multi-select. What are the risk factors for SIDS? Gender, we know males are more. Secondhand smoke, if they've been sick recently, SIDS decreases the risk for um, SIDS. So it's definitely not breastfeeding. What does the rooting reflex enable the infant to do? So when you stroke their little cheek, they're gonna root, they're gonna look, where's my bottle, where's my breast? Very good. We use this a lot in breastfeeding to encourage that sucking. Multi-select. A child's been admitted with profuse diarrhea for two days. What would you expect? Now, I'm gonna throw one of these questions in almost every week. You uh, last, Hesse, had four acid-based questions, and I know MedSurg also has it. So when you are losing a lot of stool, you're losing a lot of alkaline because of the digestive um, enzymes. So you're gonna be acid. So metabolic acidosis, and if you're losing fluid, you're gonna be hypokalemic, that's it. If you don't understand acid-base, you need to, I will give it to you every week. An infant is unable to take breast or bottles for feedings. What's important to remember? I mean, if they can't take um, anything by mouth, we still have to promote normal growth and development. And the way that we can promote that is by giving them a pacifier, that sucking. Because remember, infants, how do they self-soothe? Through their mouth, okay? How they decrease stress? Through their mouth. So offer them that non-nutritive sucking so when they can be able to uh, suck and drink properly, we have it there. And if they can't take anything, you're not going to put anything in their mouth they could choke. And there's many diagnoses that you could cause lung aspiration. You don't want that. Last question. What does an infant start to do at three months? and they should be able to start to roll over. You know, their heads are up, yes, um, but that rolling over is the big deal. Three months, it should be front to back is where they start. Let's see how we did today. Number three, Kel, good job, Kel. Number two, Sam B, good job, Sam. Number one, M, good job, MM, and four, Eden and soon to be a nurse. What I'd like you to do, please sign your attendance attestations. Do not forget, remember you need your point of entry two times in every week. You have a discussion question, you have a quiz and your attestation this week. So see if you can do it. You guys should be set up for your quizzes. I've gone over every question within this lecture and within the Kahoot. So I wish you good luck. Any questions at all with anybody? Send me a message if you want to, that math stuff or, and I'm going to post it also um, if anybody else needs it. So let me know, go over it and then I will come back and I'll do you some more tutoring with it.
I seeing you all again, guys.